Hey everybody, it's good to be back with you as we are getting ready for this Sunday's message and I'm just excited to have an opportunity to share with you again. I hope everything's going well for you. I hope you're doing good and staying safe and, and healthy in this crazy time we live in. Um, doesn't look like it's going away anytime too soon, but we're uh, pressing on. And last week we spent time in Matthew chapter 13 and we were looking at the parable of the weeds and the explanation of it and dealing with the whole end time scenario of when God will separate those who know him from those who don't. And there's definitely a place called the lake of fire that will be for eternity, that they will, uh, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There'll be all those kind of things that will happen. Uh, the good news and all this, but there's also a great place called heaven um, that Jesus is preparing for us. And all those who call upon the name of the Lord and repent will be saved and God is preparing a place for us. Uh, so I'm going on in the parables and the next two parables are the, it's the parable of the pearl of great price and, and also the parable of a, a field that was um, had a treasure in it. And so we're going to talk about those two parables in light of what does that mean for us? How, what is Jesus actually saying here? And I hope when you understand all that we're going to go through in the scriptures we're going to look at, that you'll see that, you know, we've talked a lot about this idea of having a first aid kit, Christianity, or intellectual faith, or all these kind of things, but it's it's about when you really put your trust and your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. And if you've done that, you can have peace, you can have great excitement and joy, and you can look forward to the end, but those who have not done that, um, they only have terror to look forward to. I mean, because their life is going to be unveiled and everything's going to be laid bare and they will give an account for everything they've done. But those who are in Christ, Jesus has paid the price for our sins and he's justified us through his blood that he shed on the cross and he made atonement for us, meaning that when judgment comes because of the blood of Christ, judgment will pass over us. But these two parables are powerful to me because it made me think a lot about when I first became a believer and I'll talk about that here in a minute. But let me read these two parables to you. <clears throat> Chapter 13, verse 44 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. And the second one is like it. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all he had and bought it. So let me start to talk about this. Jesus is talking about understanding, if we understand who he is, the king of the universe, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the great I am, he's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. There's no one who comes before him, no one who comes after him. When he said it was finished, it was finished. And he, he did everything that was needed for us to be redeemed by his blood, that the full price for our sins was paid for on that cross, and that um, he fulfilled all the righteous requirements on the law on your behalf and mine. And because of that, we have eternal life if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. And I talked a lot about that last week, about the need to repent, turn fully to Jesus from the world. And when you do that, Jesus says we become born again. He said he'd send another, a counselor, a helper, one who will convict us of sin, one who will teach us and correct us and train us in righteousness. And that's the Holy Spirit. So when you give your life to Christ, his spirit comes and he makes his home in us. And in light of that, you have the Father, you have the Son, you have the Spirit. So if you have the Spirit, you have the Father and the Son. But the power of this is Jesus is saying, man, if you knew who I am, if you really know me, you would do anything to be with me. Because what I have is so powerful, so amazing, so awesome, that there's nothing in all the universe that compares to it. Not all the money we can get on this earth, not all the riches and, and things and vehicles and houses and, and all the relationships, nothing compares to knowing Jesus. And I, I'm going to take us through some scriptures that teach further <clears throat> on this idea of understanding when you realize who Jesus is, you'll do anything. you do anything to be with him. And so just real short before we go there, when I was in my journey and, and asking the question, Lord, if you're real, I want to know you. And Jesus began to 
unveil himself to me. He began to reveal himself to me in powerful ways. I started reading in the New Testament and I literally I would sit down and just, that was my full prayer. Lord, if you're real, I want to know you. Please make yourself known to me if you're real. And man, the words of the Bible just began to jump off the page and hit me in the face until that day I broke, ran to the altar, fell on my face, shook like a leaf, couldn't even kneel and gave my life to Jesus. But the good news there was the moment I did that and I got off the ground, I was a different person. The love of Christ overwhelmed me and filled my heart. I knew I was forgiven. I knew that he had saved me. And so I've been on a journey ever since then. And from that moment, I was committed to go anywhere, do anything for Jesus that I might be the witness that he called me to be. And so I want to get in here and talk a little bit more because Jesus gives us some instructions on what it really means to follow him. See, there's a lot of people, here's the way I like to put it, that make Jesus a part of their life, but he's not their life. You know there's a big difference? The question you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> is Jesus my life? I mean, is he the only one? And I like to draw a circle on the page, and, and, and I draw a bigger circle around it, and in the center I put Jesus. He's the center of my universe. And off of that I pie everything that I do, work, family, relationships, church, gym, all those things. So Jesus is the center of everything that I do that I realize that everything in my life has to reflect his love and his grace and his truth so that I might have opportunity to share with others the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But I want to look through this, and if you have your Bibles, Matthew 16, and starting with verse 24, listen to what it says. This is Jesus speaking again. He says to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So he goes into more detail, and I'm going to talk about this in a minute, but says, for that will, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. And again, in the beginning, he says that if anyone would come after me, if anybody would choose to come to me in repentance, then he must what? Deny himself, meaning we have daily, I have to get up and deny myself the old fleshly ways and the things that I would do. And I'm not perfect at it, and you won't be either. But it's a growing process of learning to live and walk as Jesus lived and walked. And we must deny ourselves, pick up our cross and daily and follow Jesus. So picking up your cross daily is literally realizing that you take the good news, the gospel, you take Jesus everywhere you go. So if you're working in a factory or an office or in a hospital, in a lawyer's office, if you're working in any office, doesn't matter where, in a school or your teacher, doesn't matter what you do, construction work, it doesn't matter. Where, where you go, you have denied yourself in the sense that you realize this isn't about me anymore. It's about me sharing about Jesus. It's not about me. It's about Jesus. And so when I pick up my cross and follow him, I am literally taking Jesus with me in, in wherever I work. It's like I go to the bus garage and drive the bus in the morning, afternoon. Not right now because we're all quarantined. But when I'm doing that, I drive early in the morning and afternoon. But on that bus, I realize I am on mission. As the Father sent me, Jesus speaking, I am sending you. Where? To go and be a light to the world that there's hope. There's hope in Jesus. But Jesus goes on here and he says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. And what he's talking about, you can't, if you really accept Jesus, how you view the world, how you view money, how you view relationships, how you view your stuff, everything changes. You realize I'm just a steward of all that God has given me. How am I using it for his glory? Is Jesus being exalted in everything that I do? And that's a process. It's a learning curve. It's like every day I get up and I learn more and more about what it looks like to live like Jesus, to walk like Jesus, to touch people the way Jesus touched people, to tell people about the love of Christ, to help someone that's hurting to encourage someone instead of just being me, 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 me. It becomes about others. Two greatest commandments. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. 
Philippians 2 tells us not only care about our own interests, but it literally consider other people's interests as greater than your own. Consider others better than yourself. It's all in our attitude how we approach people. And I'm telling you, that one tripped me up for a while because I'm thinking, oh, I can treat them like myself, but to treat them better than myself? What's that look like? It's called being a servant. It's called not caring about your own reputation, but caring about somebody else's reputation. It's called building someone else up instead of building you up. Man, I'm still learning. I'm still learning about what it looks like to walk this faith out. But it goes on here. He literally warns us, if you do this, if you don't lose your life, meaning that you begin to realize it's not about me, it's about Jesus, you begin to walk out and help others come to know who Jesus is. As you do that, more and more of Christ shines through you. His love, his grace, his kindness, his mercy, his compassion. And people begin to see that it's real in your life. But it goes on here, and it says, but whoever loses life for my sake will find it. And literally what Jesus is saying, that this, this lie that we've been fed by the world, the flesh, and the devil, those are our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. The lie that we've been fed is, get all you can get now. Live for yourself. You've got to take care of yourself. We hear that through everybody. You've got to take care of yourself first. Can I just tell you, if you begin to care about others, and begin to love others, begin, begin to lay your life down for others, man, you're going to be just fine. Because you will find yourself. You'll find out who you're really created to be. You'll find out the love and the joy and the peace that comes from being Christ's disciple, his follower. And it goes on and says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? We have a, I mean, we got to admit, how many of us, through the years, we've been on a pursuit. We've been on a pursuit. If I can get this job, make this much money, buy this house, go on this trip, be able to do vacations this way, then I'm going to be, I'm a success. I finally made it. I finally have everything I need. And, and you know what's interesting, if we're honest, when we get to those places, they're just as empty. Some of my greatest memories in the whole world are memories of when Connie and I first started out. Man, we didn't have hardly anything. Started having babies, three beautiful little girls. And we had a little dinky car. Didn't have AC, didn't have a radio, crank up windows. Oh man, you can't even buy a car like that today. And we lived in a little dinky eight, 900 square foot of townhouse, just trying to survive. You know, I look back and all the times we just had to trust in the Lord and how many times it came through. And I worked all the time and I was always doing stuff. We made it. You know why? Because Jesus provided for us. Because we were on mission. We were, we were going to school. We were doing what God called us to do. We were being faithful to go. Now, not everybody's called to go to school. Some of us are called to work in a factory. Some of us are called to work in an office. Some of us are called to do construction. But do you realize the moment you gave your life to Christ, that now you're on mission. It's no longer about you. It's no longer about just working a job. It says work is unto the Lord. And when we do that, we're going to give our best effort. We're going to be the best employee. We're going to be the best person as far as the witness and do the hardest work. Because people are going to see that this Jesus we talk about is real. And in here it goes on. And it says this. Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? I mean, nothing's more important than knowing Jesus. Nothing's more important than putting your faith and your trust in the finished work of Jesus on the cross. Because if you haven't done that, you're going to forfeit your soul. You won't be saved. And I'm telling you, Jesus said it himself, I desire that none should perish, that all should come to eternal life. My heart is that all my friends, all my family, all my acquaintances, all my neighbors, everybody I run into have opportunity to come to know Jesus. Even strangers on the street that I run into. I hope I get to share the love of Christ with. It says, For the Son of Man is going to come and his with his Father's angels, with his angels in the glory of his Father, and he will repay each person according to what he has done. Do you realize how powerful that's going to be? <laughs> Do you realize that Jesus literally speaks about us as his heir? We're heirs of Christ. 
We're heirs of all that he has. We've been a, when we give our lives to Christ, we're adopted into the family of God. Now our family tree is huge. As you read the Bible, all these stories and people and throughout the whole world who give their lives to Christ are all part of our family tree. We're one big family, the family of God. You're called a child of God. And I just love it when you look at all this stuff that Jesus is talking about. You know, in John 14, 6, I mean, 14, 1 through 6, listen to what it says. Because I want to encourage you, don't let your hearts be troubled, right? So we're all, we're worried. We're worried we're going to have, I was in a store today getting something, a part I needed to fix something on my truck. And this guy's just gloom and dooming it, man. We're, we're going in, we're going to have a major recession. We're going into the, a Great Depression, just like we did in the 30s. And I'm just listening. And I'm like, well, maybe we will. Are you ready? Are you going to be able to do this? I could lose everything and I'm just fine. You know why? Because I'll have my wife and my kids, grandkids. And even if we one of us dies or some of us die in the midst of this, we're okay because every single one of us are in Christ. And we're running a race to cross a finish line to be with Jesus in, in eternity. And I just want to encourage you, listen to what it says in John 14, verses 1 and following. It says, Let not your hearts be troubled. Isn't that good news? Believe in God. Believe also in me. And I just love this. So he's saying, he knows that we're going to have our hearts at times we are going to be troubled. We live in a troubled time. But do you understand that greater is he who lives in you than he who is in the world? <laughs> that you can do all things, according to Philippians 4.13, you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul's prayer says that we might be strengthened from within through the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that this is just a dress rehearsal? Do you understand that this is so temporary? We're a vapor. We're here today and gone tomorrow. Anybody that was in my class in 1980, we all know this year is our 40-year class reunion. And it's been canceled. But we have a 40-year class reunion. We've been out of high school for 40 years. We're not on top of the hill anymore. We're on the other side. We're starting to slide down the hill. We only have so many years left. Some of you might only have a week left. Some of you might have two years left, 10 years, 30, maybe even 40 years left. But how fast did the first 58 go? It's like a blink. But listen, it's only the beginning if you know Jesus. Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have, not, would have, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you. So Jesus is, when well, he's leaving, is going to prepare a place for us. And I love this. In God's house, there are many rooms. Man, I wonder where my room's going to be, but who's going to be in their room? There's so much to see and do. I can't wait to be a part of everything that's going on in the kingdom of God. And I, again, I've told you before, but I believe God has a job for me, and I want to be about that. I want to be creative. I want to be doing the things that he's doing. I want to be a part of his creation as he's still continuing to create. Man, we're going to see things that blow our mind. Things that we would never believe if we weren't there. It says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again. will take you to myself. And, and it says, and where I am, you may be also. I mean, we're going to be, he's going to come back and take us to be with him forever in his kingdom. And it goes on to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And there's no way the Father except through me. So my question for you this morning as we're looking at the cost of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. So we're looking at understanding what should it look like with us following Jesus. You know, I want you to think about Jesus' life. What did Jesus do? Everywhere Jesus went, he helped those who were hurting. He touched the sick. He raised the dead. He healed the lepers, he, the deaf hear, the blind see, the mute speak, but there was something so much more important. He healed the soul. People were so depressed and oppressed that they didn't have any hope. Tell me we're not living in a day like that. And Jesus is saying, don't let your hearts be troubled. I'm here. See, he hasn't left us. He's not just hanging out in heaven, leaving us. 
says he walks among us. He promises that he'll walk with us to the end of the age, that he's here, right here with us through the Holy Spirit. He promises to give us strength, authority, power, gifts to do the work of the kingdom. My question is, have you sold yourself out to Jesus? Are you living all out for Jesus today? Are you walking in his grace and his love? Do you know Matthew 16, 18, I just love this. He's talking to Peter, and Peter was struggling and wrestling with things. He said, Peter, on this rock, meaning you, I'm going to build my church, because they were the beginning of the church. He was, he was conferring a kingdom on these 12 young guys, 11 young guys, and the 12th one became Paul the Apostle, and Matthias was another one. But he conferred a kingdom on them and said, I'm going to build my church on you. And he goes on, but he goes further. He says, and the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And you know, that never really hit me. I mean, I always thought, no, it won't, the gates of hell won't be able to defeat the church. But one day God spoke to me and says, Danny, don't you understand? Don't you understand? What I'm saying is that you are the church and it won't prevail against you. Even though you feel you're weak, even though you feel you fumble, even though you feel you fail, I'm with you. Greater am I who lives in you than he is in the world. I've got you. Man, I love that. Made me think of a story, and I want to end it today telling you a powerful story of an experience I had when I was in Cambodia. Went on a mission trip to Cambodia many years ago now, and I was in Colorado Springs at the Clay House Church there. And there was a group of us, six of us, that went. And I spoke at a field forum, and and the, my team led worship, helped with youth and kids. And so the missionaries that were all in Cambodia came together and they had this field forum, which was a conference. It was a time of refreshing, teaching, prayer, doing some business that needed to be done in Cambodia. And, and God used this team in a powerful way to encourage these missionaries. But God moved in such a powerful way during this field forum. We went, we went up to Poi Pet. Cambodia, just by the Thai border there. And we were going to work on a church there, but Soot and Sinalao, who are just awesome, unbelievable people, I wish you could meet them, um, said, we, we feel like God's moving in such a powerful way. We, we don't want to do that. We want to go into these villages and preach. So we were in this one village, and I, I ended up preaching in uh, seven different villages, preached seven different messages. We Several of our team shared testimonies. Uh, Jacob Davis led music and shared testimonies. It was just, it was an unbelievable time. One of my greatest memories uh, to this day. But one of the stories that we heard and, and actually got to meet this family was in this one little village. And it was just incredible because their, their, their beds are made out of uh, bamboo sticks, you know, and they lay on this hard. I just can't even fathom. I mean... It's a different world, and you're over there, and you begin to understand your world picture, your view of life changes a lot when you get to see some of these cultures, and, and I've been blessed to go to different cultures and see so many different things, and to see God's Spirit move in power, and we saw God do unbelievable, incredible miracles while we were gone in Cambodia, but this was one that happened before we were ever there, and we got to meet this family in this one village, and we heard the story, so the, the man and his wife came out, and they had like six or seven kids. There was a lot of kids, uh, and and I'm not sure exact number, but there was a lot of kids. And so he's that that family got saved, and they're the only ones in this in this village that that have come to Jesus. And everybody else is Buddhist, kind of a Buddhist Hindu mix kind of thing, and it's real dark. Um, until you go to a place like that and see it in reality. And instead of what America looks, makes it look like and see it in reality, it is a whole different deal. But anyway, so that village then, they had a well in that village, okay? And th this is the coolest story. Um, and they would not let them, because they gave their life to Christ, get water from that well. So they literally walked five miles to get water and carry it back to their place. On a, almost daily, they had to have somebody getting water. And so they were burdened, but the dad was, the kids were all young. The dad would walk over uh, to Thailand and, and 
try to find work. And when he was walking over there, stepped on a landmine. So when the Khmer Rouge was there and all the things that happened this, in the 70s, um, they put all these landmines, tank mines everywhere, and they've been sweeping, trying to get rid of them, but they're still there. And he stepped on this landmine and blew his leg off. And by God's grace and miracle, he lived. But the problem was, he was the only one who could work and fend for their family. So there's two really cool things that happen in this story. You talk about a miracle. So they they find him, and by God's grace, he, he makes it and he lives. And But there's no, they can't make a living. They can't get food. And they were just praying, oh God, help us. What are we going to do? And in their little dinky property, which would be the size of most lots in Newton, like a house lot, not a great big one, but a normal size lot. And they have a little dinky house on this thing. And they began to pray and these trees began to grow up on their property. But here's the deal. It grew up all over their property. Right on the line where it became somebody else's property, they wouldn't grow. They grew on their property. And these trees, the leaves are a delicacy in Cambodia. And it completely provided for their family. Is that not awesome? Man, I just wept when I heard this. I thought, God, you're so good. They didn't have any other resources. They didn't have government to kick in. They didn't have Title 19. They didn't have anything. They had no resources. And so this is the first miracle. They even would try to take up the trees and plant them in other spots to help people out. And they wouldn't grow. Only in their lot. Well, then a common service, which is part of Christian Missionary Alliance that I'm a part of, it came in and a common service is a relief service. And they came in and put a well right on their property. And two weeks after that well got put in, the village well dried up. You know, they could have said, no way, man. We're not going to we're not gonna let you drink from our well. But you know what they did? They, with open arms, said, come, drink from this well. We'll let this well be the village well. It's on our property. Be calm. And you know, now today, the whole village gave their life to Christ. All of them. Almost all of them are in Christ now because they saw love and grace. They saw forgiveness. They saw a family that was living all out. They didn't shrink back because all the pressure they were giving them because they turned away from Buddhism. They stayed true to following Jesus. And look what God did. Can I just tell you? I can tell you story after story about people who when they give their life to Christ, their family rejects them. It happens in our culture, but it happens a lot in the Muslim culture. It happens a lot in Hinduism and, and Buddhism and all the different religions of the world. When somebody comes to Christ because they reject that religion now, that family will denounce them that they ever knew them. Sometimes they'll even kill their own family because they're no longer following what they think is their God. And I've always wondered, man, what? why would you follow a God that's, only angry, all full of hate. All he's doing, you, I mean, you kill your own family. And I look at this and I think often, are you all in? You know, because I was all in. It took many years, but 15 years in to being a believer, my mom and dad both gave their life to Christ. My sister's given her life to Christ. I'm blessed that all my kids and their husbands and their grand, all my grandkids know Jesus. It's a miracle that I believe with all my heart. It's because my wife even told me she had a dream. And, I mean, God spoke to her and said, because we were struggling about coming to Arizona. It'd be so far away from our kids. And, but we were convinced God was calling us. And, and Connie heard in her own heart that, uh, man, if you don't continue to go as I call you to go, your children might lose heart as well and not go where they need to go. See, my kids are following Jesus. They're going where he tells them to go. And I got to tell you something, hardest thing I've ever dealt with. Prayed my whole life that my kids would follow Jesus. And they are. I pray they'd go anywhere that God called them. And they are. But something happened that I wasn't prepared for. They had kids. I have grandkids. I have to admit, that was a struggle for me because I love being around my grandkids. I love sharing life with them, teaching them, playing with them, having fun with them, wrestling with them. And here I am, clear out in Arizona. I don't get to see them that often, but you know what? I know that I know that I'm supposed to be here. And I know God's honoring that. And the time that we get with our families 
always precious. It's always powerful and fun. And we have a great time. So I just want to encourage you. I want to ask you, when you look at that, have you found the pearl of great price? The hidden treasure? It's Jesus. Jesus is the pearl of great price. Jesus is the hidden treasure. Have you been able to get all the way in and understand that it's only in Christ? Only as you do what he calls you to do. And that could be working in a factory. That could be working in an office. That could be working in a hospital. It could be working in a school. It could be being a coach. or It could be anything. Police officer, DNR, fireman. It could be anything. It doesn't matter what it is. Are you all in? And are, Do you understand now that you work for the Lord, not for the place anymore? Do you understand that you're there to be a witness? Man, I want to encourage you today. The greatest thing I've ever done. The greatest thing I've ever done is go where Jesus calls me. I've been in South America. I've been in Haiti. I've been in Mexico in prisons there and preached in there. I've been in, in Cambodia, been in Thailand and Bangkok. I've seen Korea, been in Korea, been in different places. I haven't gone near enough places. There's, I got friends who have been in like 86 countries. I can't even imagine. But everywhere I've had the privilege to go, I've got the privilege to preach and to teach the word. Man, I want to encourage you. Know Jesus. Ask him. Make yourself known to me. Unveil your heart to me. Show me how to be a witness. It says, let your light shine before men in such a way, Matthew 5, 16, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. And I still like to say, let your light shine before men in such a way they may see Jesus is real in you. Be an authentic, real person. <sighs> People need to know that Jesus loves them. That he forgives them. That there's hope. <laughs> Even in death, there's hope. So I just encourage you tonight, or today, I should say, ah, live for the Lord. Father, I pray in Jesus' name that you bless every single person that watches this and that you fill them with your spirit, Lord, that you would draw them to yourself. Lord, would you unveil in their heart and give them a divine revelation of who you are, that they might love you more and serve you with all their heart. Help us to know, Lord, that we need to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow you, that we need to take you everywhere we go to realize we're going to be a light, a witness for your glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord bless.